The future of apologetics is eschatology. But really, when you think about what it is um, that these folks are envisioning in what I call the futurist dream, uh, it is nothing short of a full-blown cosmology. It is a new worldview and uh, equipped with, uh, fully equipped with their own narrative of both creation and consummation. Well, hello and welcome to The Apologetic Dog, where it's our heart's desire to contend for the gospel of grace. And so if you look at the logo, you see that bearded apologetic dog, and embedded in the logo you see 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. Uh, This is a verse that kind of grounds this apologetic ministry where Paul tells Timothy, And to all Christians, O Timothy, guard the deposit that's been entrusted to you. And Timothy, avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. And so at the apologetic dog, uh, this is a reference to Christians. We're to guard the deposit, the gospel of grace, and we war against those worldviews that contend with Christianity, that rival the knowledge of God. And we do that by standing firm on God's truth. And so I just want to thank you for tuning in. And I just I have one quick announcement that I'd like for all of you to be made, made aware of is coming up in February. This is a little bit ways away. Uh, Myself and Dr. Frost, we're going to be speaking at a pre-conference hosted by Jeffrey Rice. um, And we are going to be speaking on the dangers of full preterism. And so this is a part of a much broader uh, conference that will we'll get into the importance of Calvinism, uh, explaining th- our view of who God is is so important. The God, the triune God that we worship is sovereign. I know that's a surprise to people, um, but you cannot thwart God. And so the questions about Calvinism have been on the rise, and there needs to be good answers. What has God said about himself according to his word? And so this conference is geared around asking those deep questions because your view of God has a direct impact on your view of man, what that looks like and how we relate to God. And so I believe Dr. White will be participating in a debate at this conference um, against somebody that opposes the Augustinian view of predestination. So this is all coming at you in February. So be on the lookout for that. And so today um, is a very special episode where I have a guest on, um, and I cannot wait for you to, to know more and more about this individual and all the projects that he's on. But I met him at G3 a couple years ago, and his name is Emilio. Did I get that right? You sure did. They don't get it right at Starbucks, but that's you did pretty good. <laughs> I, I'm with you. My last name's Nortier. I've heard everything <laughs> under the sun, and I just tell them it's okay. It's French, and so they just have to take my <laughs> yeah, that's right. It. But Emilio, thank you so much for coming on The Apologetic Dog, where I deal with primarily apologetics, but I also serve as a pastor and elder at 12.5 Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And so you're a pastor as well. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, we just, matter of fact, just planted a new church, uh, City View Church in Frisco, Texas, just a, a young church plant and uh, families that gather together for the sake of worshiping the triune God and really just worshiping in light of our conscience oh, and mm. around central uh, theological uh, convictions, as you know, and uh, just excited to uh, be part of a Reformed church that really wants to uh, walk in the Reformed path of 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 the Reformed tradition and, and Reformed theology. And, uh, you know, the Reformed community is getting mm. kind of smaller and smaller in, in terms of real faithful Reformed theology. So uh, I'm just blessed to be with families that want to honor the Lord uh, mm. by cultivating that Reformed theology in their own lives and 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 kind of living it out in a total worldview kind of mm-hmm. thing. So yeah, it's 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 great. It's a blessing. Thank you. So you're part of the church planting life. How old is y'all's church? Uh we're about one year old at this point. Okay. So it's a very, very uh very fresh, very young church. And uh uh, I've been pastoring here in Texas since 2007, pastored in Fort Worth for several years. I uh, pa- recently uh, uh, resigned from pastoring at a different church here in Frisco. Uh, 
And uh, that's what kind of led to this new church plant. So there you go. Well, that's exciting. I understand the joys and the pains of church planting. So 12.5 <laughs> Church comes from a Bible verse. People are like, 12.5, is that what time y'all meet? I'm like, no. It comes from <laughs> Romans 12, verse 5, about the church. We're individually one of another, but we come together as the body of Christ. And so, Emilio, yesterday marked a completion of three years in our church plant. Great. And so we're, we're just excited. We're actually getting to move into the heart of my town. Um, about a month, we have a new building that we just signed a lease for. And so I feel you, brother, with the church yes. planting life. It comes with so many joys uh, because there's a lot of barriers and yet, yeah. um, people that are really hungry for Christian fellowship and um, under, wanting to know more about sound, robust theology of who God is, those people tear through those barriers. Um, and so you see that really fast um, in, in these yeah. people's lives. So, hey, we will pray for you. And so what's, what's the name of y'all's church again? City View. Uh, City View Church. And that, that is rooted in uh, Hebrews 11. Mm. where we are told that uh, we are to look to the city that God has prepared for us and that we are to confess ourselves that we are strangers and exiles in this world. And then if we do that, God is not ashamed to be called our God. And of course, because uh, Hebrews goes on to say, because he has prepared a city for us, so city for them. So uh, City View is all about that sort of heavenly eschatological vision of the ultimate city of God, and so it's uh, it's definitely rooted in that heavenly hope that we have. Uh-oh, you mentioned eschatology. Um, that's been a uh -oh. hot-button topic. Yeah, um, <laughs> I just got done speaking at a conference uh, about two weekends ago called Eschatology Matters, How Then Shall We Live? Because, mm. like you know, your view of the end times has a direct impact how you live your life here and now. And mm. so <clears throat> you also run um, a a YouTube channel and ministry, Red Grace Media. Is that right? That's right. So what's some of the goal and vision with Red Grace Media? Uh, you know, Red Grace Media just kind of started out as a blog uh, initially, uh, and we did uh, some podcasting uh, in the primitive stages of that. But now, uh, Red Grace Media, we now have uh, a YouTube channel, weekly YouTube channel, Red Grace Live, and uh, that airs every Sunday night at 7. And then we have also a podcast, Christ and Kingdom, uh, that you can find in you know the Apple Store and every everywhere else. Basically, you can get a podcast. Uh, and then also on top of that, Red Grace Media is also uh, part of a, a, an aspect of my ministry that I never thought would actually be uh, part of my ministry, which is filmmaking and mm. developing m material through film. And so if people are obviously familiar with the American gospel and then now the American gospel streaming platform, AGTV, uh, I'm on the board of directors for that. And also uh, I've created content on that channel, a different film projects that people can find there. And uh, that's something we want to continue to do. And, and several works are actually kind of in the works of that. Matter of fact, one film we just finished uh, and we're just kind of struggling with how to get it out and what's the best way to move forward with it. But I just finished a film with uh, um, Peter Jones, an apologist, theologian out of Westminster, now retired, but uh, Truth Exchange Ministry, Peter Jones. And it also features Steve Lawson and uh, Ken oh, Ham. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, film documentary. And uh, just uh, uh, Peter Jones is a profound thinker and a profound voice uh, in in today's kind of pagan world and pagan mm -hmm. context that we live, this sort of post-Christian era that we're living through right now. Um, very, very important. I'm very pleased with the project. I did another project a long time ago that people still, I get, it's amazing, I still get people giving me feedback on it. But many years ago, I actually, I did a film called Unpopular. People can watch that for free on YouTube. Um, oh, wow. And that's with James White and Paul Washer and myself. And uh, that was just really more than anything, just a gospel presentation, just making man aware of their need for Christ and, and in a way where we used media, uh, but to convey that powerful message through film. And so those things are um, a, definitely a burden of mine. Uh, definitely, I feel called to be involved in media production and filmmaking and things like that. And so God has brought me uh, several brothers to help with that. 
And uh, we've got other things kind of lined up and ready to go. It's just, you know, when you get into film, uh, after you film, the other big factor is production and uh, and funding. And so that all boils down to, you know, getting everything in order that way. So, but I think that we're going to, I think we're going to be continuing to put out content here in the near future. All right, we look forward to that, and I will list that mo- that movie you were talking about that's on YouTube. I'll list that yeah. link in the show notes below. And so, uh, so yeah, you you've you spent time with Ken Ham and Steve Lawson. I believe those are going to be some speakers along with Doctor White at G three coming up in a few days. Yeah, I'll be there, uh, Lord willing. Um, that I went to one a couple years ago um and that was great that was a fun time big conference i think this year may be the biggest ever something like 8200 at least uh so i mean we're talking about 8200 people i mean that's a lot Hmm. so that's a big conference you know um uh, yeah i believe it's on the sovereignty of god so this is like the mecca (laughs) yeah now, yeah, you sure. said you remembered me because I think yeah. I, I first met you at the last G3. And yep. uh, I was like, oh, my goodness, this is Emilio Ramos. And uh, I was I like, first... oh my goodness, this is Jeremiah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about all that. But I first recognized you or saw you on Marlon's channel. Uh, Marlon Wilson does the, the Gospel Truth uh, YouTube channel. Please, um, if you're watching this, uh, go support Marlin and check out some of his debates. He's had a bunch of scholars on his channel, uh, like Emilio, and I've seen a couple of your debates, and oh my goodness, you kept your composure debating an atheist that would have probably drove me crazy, Uh, but you contended for the faith well, uh, with love and respect and gentleness, sanctifying the Lord in your heart, and so that was apparent, and you stood, can I say presuppositionally, on God's word? Sure. (laughs) Sure. Yes, of, uh, of course. Transcendentally, presuppositionally, uh, probably most accurate of all in a Vantilian presupposition uh, way. <laughs> you're, you're speaking my language, uh, Emilio. Yeah. And so that also, I, I do want to do another plug to a, a mutual friend of ours, um, Eli Iala at Revealed Apologetics. Um, that's such a good brother who's doing works um, in the world of apologetics. And I look up to and learn a lot from him, like you said, with these these transcendental ideas, understanding that the world we live in must proceed from the God who is sovereign and triune and has revealed himself to us. Hmm. And so you do a lot of work in apologetics. And so we were talking earlier about kind of this this new age apologetics um, that you spend a lot of time um, dealing with. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Honestly, I, I haven't really done anything um, substantial on it yet other than uh, some YouTube videos. I did probably seven or eight, maybe maybe 10 YouTube videos where I deal with what I've called the new apologetics. And the new apologetics basically is just saying that the old apologetics, though we will always have to contend with the old, in a sense, the old lines of demarcation, uh, you know, Christian cults, uh, you know, Islam, uh, atheism and evolution and things like that. Um, maybe even, you know, textual criticism. But I think that we're in the 21st century, we've kind of entered in an unprecedented time uh, because of technology on the one hand uh, and globalism on the other hand. And typically, if you look back in the history of apologetics, you don't see very much being done uh, by way of technology and globalism. Typically, go- globalism has been sort of lumped in with a geopolitical uh, sort of framework, um, socioeconomic framework. And then technology has sort of been looked upon as benign or just as a tool. I mean, technology comes from techne, which means tool or craft. Um, And so we've looked at it like that, but now and in today's times as technology and the forces of of a socioeconomic and political system, whatever you want to call it, but it is no less than that, are coming into closer and closer alignment, especially when you think about the economics uh, that are sort of impending let's say in the le- in the next decade or so as we are being increasingly moved towards things like a digital id uh, a digital banking system those kinds of things uh, they will have remarkable effects 
upon the way that we, well, really the way that the world operates, but then that will all be lumped in, in my, in, in my opinion, that's going to be all connected to not just economics, but, but also the sociological framework of, of the way the world works all the way down to uh, worldview issues like ethics and spirituality and morality and those and, and those kinds of things. And so these are big, big tectonic sort of factors and that that have the potential to shift the course of human history in different directions. Uh, and uh, when you think about, you know, when I'm talking about the new apologetics, I'm talking a lot about futurism, and that includes uh, transhumanism, posthumanism, and robotics. And certainly we're seeing that kind of doled out right now in the culture in very incipient forms. Uh, little by little, here they come. Uh, but what they plan, at least what their ambitions are, what their dreams are for all of this, according to the leading transhumanist scholars, engineers, mathematicians, um, robotics experts, like Ray Kurzweil, Hans Marvich, Max Moore, uh, Natasha Vita Moore, many others, Damien Broderick, many of these men that Christians have no clue who they are. They're totally unfamiliar with them. Um, we can list people, let's say, in, in, in pseudo-Christian cults. We can talk about leading thinkers in Islam. We can think about you know, leading thinkers in Mormonism or Jehovah Witness or whatever, Catholics. But really, in the transhumanist world, we are dealing with what Yuval Noah Harari calls hmm. uh, the data religion. And this new data religion, I think that's actually a quite an apt description for it. But in the data religion, you know, everything is up for grabs again, as far as they're concerned, all the way down to the redefinition of what man is. Mm. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with some pretty serious forces. And, um, you know, um, I'm hoping to write something. I'm hoping to do uh, something substantial on this. And uh, it's taken my reading and my interest in a whole different direction. So uh, that's at least part of what we're talking about with a new apologetics. Well, it sounds exciting because <clears throat> you mentioned worldview. And so, you know, mm -hmm. at the apologetic dog, something I try to stress is that we're not neutral. And when we ask the question, where do we get truth? The only way to get truth is from the God of truth who cannot lie and who has revealed himself. And so I'd love some more of your insight. Um, what's what kind of encouragement do you have for Christians living in this world where, you know, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, uh, the world as we know it is shifting, right? Th these times are shifting and, you know, this affects, you know, how we're living to a particular end of history. So what would you uh, encourage the Christian with um, as we see the culture change, um, you know, left and right, you know, just just quickly? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, yeah, no, ironic, Jeremiah. It's ironic, but what we're talking about today, Jeremiah, with eschatology, um, the way that I've stated it for uh, you know podcasts and on the new apologetics videos that I produced, and even on just going forward in the YouTube channel, what we're doing is that the future of apologetics is eschatology, and that typically there's a disconnect there. And when I say that, people tend to kind of go draw a blank and kind of not understand what I'm talking about. Because when they think about eschatology, usually what we're thinking of in terms of eschatology are things like the timing of the return. Is there a rapture? What's the nature of the millennium? How is the world going to end, et cetera, et cetera. But really, when you think about what it is um, that these folks are envisioning and what I call the futurist dream, uh, it is nothing short of a full-blown cosmology. It is a new worldview and uh, equipped with, uh, fully equipped with their own narrative of both creation and consummation. And if we don't understand that, then we won't grasp uh, necessarily how to approach all of it. Let me give you an example, Jeremiah, of what I'm talking about. When you look at the leading transhumanist literature and globalist literature, it is a repeated theme over and over. You, I can show you the books where repeatedly these thinkers begin their books the same exact way. They begin the book by giving you a retelling of the story of the origin of man and everything. 
And so they begin with a basic evolutionary framework. And then their focus begins to focus on progress, advancement, innovation, and eventually technology. Until we get all the way to what they're talking about now, which is no longer evolution. Uh, matter of fact, in the cutting edge futurist literature, the language of evolution is, is been replaced. And now the language is the language of anti-evolution or what they call self-evolution. In other words, we're no longer undergoing the evolutionary process in a passive way. We will now, in a sense, take the reins of evolution over, self-evolve, and in that way, self-advance wow. into whatever next stage of humanity or the next stage of man down to our biology, down to our, uh, down to our uh, economy, uh, down to our uh, environment, where everything is going to be reimagined. And it's all in the language of, of advancement. And for that reason, it's eschatological, because we're talking about taking mankind to the next level. Um, you know, the Humanity Plus website is all about moving humanity to the next stage of evolution. Yes, but they don't really care about evolution anymore uh, mm. because you see uh, transhumanism, which just means man and machine coming closer together and humans being augmented uh, and being advanced through technology and altered somehow whether it's wearable technology or implantable technology. But that leads all the way to post-humanism, mm -hmm. where this technology not only changes us, but slowly begins to replace us. And truly, truly committed post-humanists like Hans Marovitch would say that the final step as far as he can see into the future, and that's why I call it the future's dream uh, not only because it's a fantasy, it is, it's not going to happen, but this is what they envision for the far future, for the distant future, is that Hans Marovitch would argue that robots uh, that are empowered by at least artificial general intelligence, if not artificial super intelligence, will leave humanity in the dustbin of history and they will go on to essentially... Uh, to quote the old Star Trek intro, to go where no man has gone before, <laughs> to explore strange new worlds and new civilizations. In other words, the robots will own the future and we will live vicariously through them. So this is, we can laugh at this and we can caricature it as some sort of sci-fi, uh, in a sci-fi cartoonish kind of a way, but it, it kind of like, it's like this, Jeremiah. It's like it's all fun and games until billions and billions of dollars are being spent on it. Mm, I see. And so when you see where the money is going in places like Google and, you know, uh, Synchron and Neuralink and, you know, when, when you're starting to see that the money is going to these tech innovators that have this worldview and the, ultimately that have this vision, it begins to make the conversation a bit more serious. Well, you said a shocking yet important statement. You said the future of apologetics is eschatology. And I love that uh, because like I've been, I've been delving into the world of eschatology more and more, realizing that your view of the end times directly impacts how we live here and now. So what's your encouragement to the Christian? Um, about, you know, in this time where yeah. everything is kind of going robotic, um, you know, is there anything that you would say directly how to help us um, stay tethered to Christ, looking to him during these, these times? Yeah, you know, um, I would say that our hope is eschatology um, because we have to believe it. And as times become increasingly more complicated, more uh, delusional, deceptive, when things become more increasingly um, uh, difficult to discern as far as, let's say, for example, 
how much of the application of cutting edge technology do we incorporate into our lives? And the next step coming up here real soon, coming to a, coming to a neighborhood near you is uh, how much of this do we incorporate into our body? Um, then we need to really, really believe what the Bible teaches about eschatology, about the Perusia hope, about the consummation, about the true nature of what advancement is. And for that, we need 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, 45, all the way to verse, uh, let's say, uh, 52, and then following into the resurrection. But we need to understand that humanity is advanced through the Spirit of God and through resurrection, not through technology and human augmentation or something like that. And nanotechnology, that's not the way we're going to advance ourselves forward. So we, we have to keep that hope in front of us. Um, and we need to understand that we are building a system, all of us, like it or not. Jeremiah, I would argue, mm. uh, based, on, based on Revelation 17, 17, for example, we are all building Babel 2.0, whether you like it or not, to some degree, we are all participating in this uh, sort of Babel 2.0, uh, sort of uh, a one world sort of system, right? Until we can't build it anymore. Wow. Because we cannot build that which dishonors God and that which dishonors Christ. And at that point, the encourage you asked me for encouragement. And so I'm sorry if this doesn't sound encouraging but the encouragement is that we also have to develop a healthy theology of mm. suffering and even martyrdom mm -hmm. and so if we don't i think we're we're sort of uh shortchanging ourselves and yes. so i think we're we're undermining and if you just look at the bible <laughs> i just you know did a bible study here recently uh, for our church where i said that it's difficult to find a single book in the new testament that is not predicated on persecution. Mm. And you look at the book of Hebrews, you look at what's going on in Colossae, you look at what's going on in Philippi, you look at what's going on in John's letters. I mean, you, you look at the book of Revelation. I mean, persecution is the sort of, uh, it is the assumption <laughs> of both the author and the audience. And yet, uh, thankfully, we in the West are at least mainly uh, sort of removed from that mentality uh, because we are not persecuted in, in let's say, uh, in a physical way, although we are increasingly marginalized or we're oppressed through socioeconomic ways and things like that. Uh, but you got, we have to, we can't ever lose sight of the fact that the Bible is written to a persecuted people. Mm. Well, the future of apologetics is eschatology, and <clears throat> when we were talking earlier about um, thinking presuppositionally and transcendentally, you know, we're talking about, look, uh, God is the necessary starting point for our existence in the world that we look at, so he gets to tell us truth, and so it's his word, um, a robust understanding of the whole counsel of God and the eschaton, um, where we will see the parousia, his coming, um, to restore all things, and you're talking about you know, in this world that says, look, the, the evolvement of humanity is robotic and you know, essentially artificial. Yeah. Well, that goes against God's word. He, he has given us insight. The one who declares the end from the beginning tells us what the end's going to look like. And for this world, it's perishing, right? Second Peter 3 tells us more about um, even though the world's going to mock um, Jesus' coming, um, it's all going to be burned up, and at his coming, he will restore all things, um, the new heavens and the new earth, right? We have this beautiful, blessed hope as Christians. And mm. so you mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, and so there's that whole chapter, um, you know, it's, ov it's over 50 verses, but the whole chapter is rooted in what our blessed hope looks like, and it's tethered to the gospel, and I love studying eschatology, and essentially there's three orthodox perspectives. You've got premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. And, you know, they, they have charitable conversations about the nature 
of, of some of these things. Uh, but at the end of the day, they can unite around the things that we hold with a close fist, that Jesus is coming, his future bodily. He's going to restore all things uh, with the resurrection of the dead, uh, the righteous unto everlasting life, and judgment to those um, who died in their sin. And so 1 Corinthians 15 says, we can rest knowing that our resurrection will be like Christ when he resurrected. So I think an encouragement for you know the, these new um, generations that are, that are coming up is being equipped with God's word and his promises. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this passage, Emilio. So 1 Corinthians uh, 15, starting in verse 20, says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his parousia, like we've been talking about, his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so, you know, we can stop there because uh, that captures so much, Emilio, of our blessed hope, right? Mm. Who Jesus is, what, what we will be resurrected like, will be like uh, Christ when he resurrected bodily, right? So I think in a lot of ways this defeats this mentality of, you know, kind of robotics and humans being one. Oh, certainly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an and to be really clear, brother, like I don't, I don't obviously believe... Uh, that the futurist dream will be realized. Uh, however, let me just make a distinction. Maybe mm -hmm. this is jumping ahead of us a little bit here. Oh, got it. Uh, you know, I did do one episode where I talked about this with uh, another guy on a different podcast, and somebody in the comment section said, um, you know, Emilio does not understand uh, post-millennialism because oh. he doesn't understand <laughs> that uh, uh, transhumanism is one of the things that Jesus will put under his feet. Uh, and of course, where we disagree is not on that point. Of course, I, I agree that Jesus will put uh, the enemy of transhumanism if it becomes antagonistic towards humanity, right? But it's, in a sense, anything belonging to this sinful world, Jesus is going to put all of these things under his feet. But I just believe that the post-millennial uh, position has erroneously exegeted Psalm 110, and they have a false interpretation of the timing of all of that and the dynamics of all of that, situating that in some sort of progressive, uh, sort of in intensive uh, kind of way leading up to the return of Christ, where through the church, um, Jesus is somehow putting all enemies under his feet. When I think it's very clear from the verse that you read here that he will do this at his coming. And so I believe that when uh, Paul quotes Psalm 110 here, he is not saying that we should expect uh, that the dynamic of the kingdom of God in this present evil age is going to be that the church should look out in expectation that all of the present enemies that we see here and now, one by one, will slowly begin to be toppled by the power of Christ through the church, I, I think that's called exaggerated eschatology, and that's ultimately motivated by an agenda for Reconstructionism, ultimately. Uh, and I think it's false. And I think you have a commentary on this passage in Revelation chapter 20, before the great white throne judgment, where John says in Revelation 20, uh, verses 14 and 15, right? Even as it says here, the last enemy to be abolished is death. Uh, and then notice in verse 27, he says, for he's put all things under his feet. <laughs> so he has put all things under his feet is demonstrated ultimately by Christ having the power to abolish death. Well, Revelation 20 tells us when all of this happens, it happens at the great Perusia judgment of Christ. And it does not happen prior to that. Um, and, and this is, um, I, I tell you what, Jeremiah, one of the things that you mentioned something, I don't know that I did a good job of explaining it, 
But in terms of the hope that we have, the encouragement that we have in light of everything that is potentially coming soon, um, you know, the hope of that is that Christ is is going to um, put all these things right, but we cannot give the church a false hope. That's something we can't do in Christian discipleship. We cannot tell the church because a Planned Parenthood institution was closed down that that is somehow evidence of Jesus subjecting all things under his feet or or or, 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 or that he will uh, you know put all of his enemies under his feet. That is not a clear indication of that. And and if we start teaching the church to view the supremacy, authority, and lordship of Christ that Paul is talking about here, if we start training the church to look at these things through the lens of our geopolitical developments, I think we undermine the totality of the Christian hope. I love the passion there, uh, because what we're emphasizing is eschatology matters, and uh, post-millennialism is orthodox, but it's different than the, the all-millennial framework, and it's different than the, the futurism of pre-millennialism. And I think you would agree with me. Uh, we see post-millennialists as brothers, and they look at all-millennialists as brothers, but there are some real differences there, how God's law is supposed to go forth and how it's going to affect the nations and humanity and eschatology. And so I love is that we can charitably speak back and forth and tell each other on both sides of the aisle um, what to look out for. Because um, I love my post-millennialist brothers, uh, and I tell everybody, look, I come out of the, the Johnny Mac pre-millennial dispensational crowd. You got to think, I was in it for eight years, Emilio. And so <clears throat> I've loved the deep study of all mill and post mill because sometimes I can't hardly tell the difference between the two. And I'm starting to see more and more there are real differences. And so getting to speak at um, the conference in Indiana, in Topeka, um, Indiana, um, a couple weeks ago was awesome because I got to hear some very clear speakers on their view within post millennialism. And you see how it does affect everything. And for you being, you know, more of the, the inaugurate kingdom come, uh, the, the all-millennial paradigm of saying, you know, Jesus is ruling reigning now, there's a difference with how we see this age and the age to come. And so this has been one of my cautions to the post-millennial crowd. And what's awesome is not everyone in the post-mill crowd views this age the same, but then there are some big cautions that I have. If we view this age that Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse as merely talking about the Jewish aeon, the, the Jewish age only, then you have real problems. Um, I don't know um, if you've looked into it uh, this way, but essentially the parousia is supposed to happen at the end of the age, right? Uh, Jesus' second coming. And so what I, what I love about the consistency within all millennialism is this age is this temporal age that's perishing which would encompass, you know, all the things uh, promised to uh, the Jewish nation or what they would be a part of. And, and many of their, their ceremonial laws were fulfilled in Christ. And we just see the destruction of the temple saying, hey, no more religion. That is dead, right? It found its fulfillment. And for, you know, the, the apologetic of the book of Hebrews is saying, y'all are neglecting such a great salvation in the person of Jesus. And y'all are falling back on all these, these dead ceremonial works and laws. And so what do you think about that? Um, I, I know you have some caution of saying uh, how we view the end times and how we get there um, are very important. But I don't know if you've looked into much about um, understanding the, the distinctions with this age and the age to come. Yeah, certainly. Actually, you know, um, uh, we recently did a couple episodes on our show where um, I'm advancing what I'm, I'm calling sort of the, the Reformed Encyclopedia. And the Reformed Encyclopedia for me consists of five components, which is Reformed Trinitarianism, stressing the idea of autotheon, John Calvin's mm. view, Reformed Biblical Theology. Uh, uh, well, let me say it this way. Reformed Trinitarianism, uh, try to say it in order, 
in, in order of the way that I think it should be thought of, reform federalism or covenant theology, <clears throat> and then also reform biblical theology in a Vossian, Kleinian sort of tradition, and then reformed apologetics in a Vantilian tradition, and, uh, and, and ultimately reformed eschatology. And mm -hmm. uh, when I say reformed eschatology, I know those sound like fighting words. Um, because people would say, well, wait a minute, I'm reformed, but I don't have your eschatology. And I say, that's fine. I, w I would make a case that when you look at the reformed confessions, for example, uh, the vast majority of reformed confessions are favorable to an amillennial position. They're certainly not Kiliast. They're not premillennial. And I would say you know, the confessional standards of reformed orthodoxy seem to be contrary to uh, postmillennialism on several grounds. Now, that does not mean the crafters or, or the people that framed some of these confessions individually did not have postmillennial leanings or postmillennial exegesis or postmillennial convictions. It is just to say that the documents themselves, for example, the Westminster, the London Baptist confessions, both uh, clearly futurist in their eschatology, we could argue idealist to some degree, even from the confessions. But there's no question that the Westminster Confession and the London Baptists believe in the coming of an Antichrist. Mistakenly, this is ironic because I think they erred mistakenly identifying the Antichrist as the Pope, which I don't think he was. But when I read when I read Calvin, I mean he does not, you know, he does not hold back in roasting the papacy and linking them to <laughs> the Antichrist. Sure, and we would say it is an Antichrist, right? It may Absolutely. be under an, an Antichrist, lowercase a, but capital A Antichrist, we would see, and I think the confessions are arguing, is a future thing, at least from the confessions. Get this, it's certainly not preterist. Oh. Got so it. It, can't, it cannot have a preterist, even a partial preterist, fulfillment. Mm. They saw Antichrist as a futuristic dynamic. Mm. together with the future apostasy and persecution of the church. Yeah. In the second Helvetic Confession, the reformers who crafted that equated a post-millennial type of vision as Zionism, Jewish dreams of some kind of carnal kingdom that is going to arise concluding in some sort of partial repristinated earth. They don't mm. support that either. And so when you look at these confessional standards, brother, I just say that's why when I'm talking about reformed eschatology, I'm talking about partially that, but I'm also talking about partially that within reformed theology rooted in rooted in federal theology as it is, rooted in, in, in biblical theology as it is, we always have to honor the two-age construction of Scripture. Adam was in a two-age construction. He had the present age, not the present evil age, but he had the present age, mm. and then he had the age to come through eschatological advancement had he op obeyed perfectly, personally, exactly the law of God in the covenant of works, and then he would have been advanced eschatologically via the tree of life together with his posterity into the age to come which is the Sabbath realm. And so uh, what happened? Well, of course, he fell. <laughs> and in the fall, what happened to that 2-age construction? The only thing that happened is that the present age became the present evil age. Mm. But it did not change the 2-age construction at all. And so in my opinion, Jeremiah, what happens under these other systems pre and post is that you have a blending together of the two ages until a tertium quid arises, a third thing, a third principle of a third dynamic or a third age, where it's not quite the present evil age anymore, but it's also not quite the age to come. Mm. And what we would argue from a reformed amillennial, I'll come back to the word amillennial, but what we would argue from a reformed amillennial position is that these are sub-eschatological structures. They're not actual eschatology proper. Mm. They fall short of eschatology. 
because they end up putting Christ in a sub-eschaton where he hasn't actually arrived at the true age to come kingdom glory. And that's something that we cannot afford to believe in Reformed theology. Uh, we cannot imagine, even as Louis Burkhoff pointed out in his systematic theology, the problem with premillennialism is that it results in multiple absurdities. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I know that's, you know, fighting words, but, but I, I think there is, but I think, Jeremiah, there's no greater absurdity than to yeah. argue that Jesus Christ will return in all of his glory, his glorified body, to once again be in the tension of an already not yet dynamic. Absolutely not. Same thing with postmillennialism. Postmillennialism envisions a time, a golden age, the millennium, where essentially, right, as the as even Bonson said, sin is reduced to negligible proportions. Mm. And that he what he calls we can experience a semi-heavenized world. There is no such thing as a semi-heavenized world. Never will be. And that is not our hope. Our aren't hope we just, is not. Are we pilgrims? Yeah. Well, our hope is not in our hope is not in uh, sort of drawing back degrees of the curse. That's not our hope. Our her, our hope is in eradicating the curse. But we don't eradicate the curse in a partial <laughs> step by step fashion. But Christ eradicates the curse altogether when he comes. Mm. So there are deeper structures to eschatology than what we tend to fight about up here in the surface. If we're just, you know, this is, uh, I hope people are okay that we're kind of playing 4D chess here because this is kind of a Van Tilian approach, uh, Jeremiah, because remember what Van Til taught. Van Til taught an indirect approach to apologetics, Right. You don't trade factoids with unbelievers. Uh, this rock in Jerusalem is this old. No, it's not. It's this old. No, we found it. It's this old. Okay, well, we're going to, oh, my experts say it's this old. My experts say it's that old. Okay, we can argue about archaeology till we're blue in the face, or we can come with an indirect argument to answer the question, can your worldview account for evidence in the yeah. first place? And so I would say it's the same thing with eschatology. Mm. All your individual points of exegesis, we need to ask the deeper structural covenantal questions. Mm. Can your covenantal theology sustain the points that you're making in your individual exegetical points you're making throughout critical texts or whatever? And I would say, brother, I would submit that only and un uniquely the amillennial position can do that and honor the covenant theology of the Bible. Amelia, you're getting me fired up over here, man. I love, <clears throat> I love it because I have a question. Because I know with the post millennial framework, uh, their battle cry is we win, right? Uh, we have yeah. a winner eschatology, right? We're not mm -hmm. going out thinking we're gonna lose, and so that's kind of the the sales pitch I hear a lot of times. And I'll I'll be honest, you know, I appreciate people being on fire for wanting to serve the Lord and be obedient to the marching orders of the Great Commission. But what's your um, immediate thoughts when they when when the critique for premillennialism and amillennialism is that is a loser mindset and a loser theology? I would say you sound too much like the Corinthian church. <laughs> uh, because in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and following, the Apostle Paul had to correct any triumphalistic spirit of the church, any delusional, you know, delusions of grandeur that you are somehow going to arrive at some kind of eschatological triumph prior to the eschaton, so that you tend to think of yourself as a winner. Uh, and Paul says, well, to use, you know, to paraphrase, I wish that we could win with you because apparently we don't understand the nature of your victory. We're paraded all day long as fools for Christ. And so you're on thrones, uh, but we're put to death. 
<laughs> and so I think what Paul was saying was, you have misunderstood the nature of this age. A, a triumph, victory, eschatological reward and vindication do not happen this side of heaven. They don't happen prior to the parousia. And if you think you do, you have arrived at some sort of pseudo kingdom element in your theology. And it, it, it is a false triumphalism that needs to be checked by biblical eschatology. And I think that's what Paul is doing in Corinthians. And so we never want to sound like that. And so I don't know how helpful even, you know, Jeremiah, this language of winning and losing, I don't know how helpful that language really is. I think it ends up just becoming sort of fodder for online banter and things like that. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, um, it, it just seems to run against the grain of the tone and the attitude of the mm -hmm. Christian church, the apostolic church, and even the teaching of Christ. When you read uh, Christ in his um, in his beatitudes, that you are that you are uh, blessed. In fact, when you are persecuted and maligned, the Apostle Paul saying, "Look, I'm content with persecutions and weaknesses, because when I am weak, then He is strong, or then I am strong." Right. So. So that we never, uh, we never get to a point of self-reliance or self-sufficiency by thinking that we ourselves are going to take the reins of, of, of this age. And, uh, you know, there's a really helpful little book. You mind if I plug a book? Oh, 100%. Go for it. Yeah. So there's a really helpful little book. It's a PhD thesis uh, by William Dennis Dennison, Bill Dennison. It's called Apologetics and Paul's Two-Age Construction. And okay. it's got that long technical name because I guess that's what you do when you write your PhD, <laughs> your, your <laughs> thesis for PhD. Uh, but uh, that little book there, um, I have found it to be uniquely, uniquely useful for understanding an actual biblical, exegetical, Pauline apologetic rooted in eschatology. Wow. So uh, maybe people will have to go back and listen to this again or whatever, but that book will really help you to understand Paul's theology of this age and the age to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I personally subscribe. I said I was going to comment on the word amillennialism because yeah. I've actually taken on a little bit of a nuance. Okay. Uh, I've added a different preposition and the Greek preposition ano. you know what it means? It means above. Okay. So I think the maybe the most accurate way that we can describe our eschatology is an ano millennialism. Because where is the millennium strictly speaking? It's in heaven. It's where listen, wouldn't you agree wherever the throne that Jesus is sitting on Right there is his reign. And so wow. if the throne of Jesus is in heaven, the reign of Jesus is in heaven in that nature and in that dynamic. That doesn't mean he's not sovereign over all things, but as Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, you do not now see all things subjected to him. Wow. And so if we're looking for visuals and if we're looking for Planned Parenthood to crumble and if we're looking for certain uh, gender ideologies to crumble, if we're looking for the crescent moon to crumble, if we're looking for, you know, uh, the, the population of the planet. I don't know if you've done the work, Jeremiah, but if you look at the population of the planet right now, you take Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. I think you have roughly 80% of the population of planet Earth. You take, in addition to that, Catholicism, all the Christian cults, animism, all the paganism in the third world, together with secularism and atheism, and you have somewhere around 90 or more percent of the planet. Now I want to ask you the question, of that percentage left, what percentage of the visible, being generous, evangelical church do you believe is really elect? Mm. See, we, 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 we can play around with eschatology, but 
these kind of thoughts here is what really puts things, th this is the rubber meeting the road, where we have to, as Christians, be self-reflective and realistic and understand narrow is the way. Wow, uh, you gave me a lot to think about there. Uh, now, my first question, um, and I love the point about the kingdom is where the throne is, right? So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So in that you nature. Say, in that nature. So help me understand how, obviously, God is sovereign here and now, but I know the post-millennial you know, battle cry is Jesus is reign, ruling and reigning now, right? The kingdom is upon us in the Gospels, we read, and... We, we see that being carried out, or how would you kind of critique that position? Well, I wouldn't crit critique it with anything with anything uh, novel or original to my own thinking. I would just use the hermeneutics of Edmund Clowney. And Edmund Clowney was the first president of Westminster Seminary. Edmund Clowney gave us a very simple hermeneutic for understanding the kingdom. And he said, if you want to understand the kingdom, just look at the king. Whatever question you have about the kingdom, ask that question concerning the king. Is the kingdom here? I don't know. Ask the question, is the king here? So let's play a little game if you if you don't mind, Jeremiah. Let me ask you these questions because I think you're <laughs> an I think you're astute enough. It. I think you're an astute enough theologian to be able to answer these questions. But let me ask you this question. Okay. In all seriousness, is the king here? I don't see him. Is that your answer? <laughs> that, that is one answer that some people may give. Okay, so if you think about it really long and hard, if your answer is he's not here, mm. are you okay with that? Yeah, I think this is one of those good questions. You got to think, I'm coming out of that pre-mill dispensational where <laughs> saying that, you know, Jesus is sovereign, but the Davi Davidic but throne is omni something. But he's also omnipresent, right? Mm, yep. And so in one sense, he is here. And so, but it all comes down to the sense, mm, right? Right. It all comes down to the sense. Uh, ask you this question. Uh-oh. Because the Bible says the kingdom of God is within. Is the king yeah. within? Mm. No, because we would say the Holy no, no, Spirit no. is within. Listen to me. Okay. Is, the king, if the, is the kingdom of God within you, yes or no? Yes. So then is the king within you? Yes. Of in course. A sense, in a sense, yeah. No, emphatically, brother, the king okay. indwells you by faith. Mm. Mm-hmm. So these are the questions, and I know they're kind of trick questions, so bear, <laughs> yeah, with, like me. So no, bear, bear with me. But this is part of the untangling of the confusion that arises today when you have people out there making hard and fast declarations about the kingdom of God, rush over the categories and confusing the categories. And so Christians are left with these false dilemmas and this mm. bifurcation that doesn't even exist where it's like either the kingdom is here or it's not here. That's right. not Christianity. That's not how we operate in Christianity. Right. There is a dynamic. There is a principle of the kingdom that adheres to the principle of the king himself. Mm -hmm. And that's what, in my opinion, that's what Hebrews 2 is talking about. God has given him all rule, all authority, right? But you don't, he subjected everything beneath his feet. But you don't see everything subject to him now. Mm. It's that simple. And so to have, to, to, to try to argue for a more geophysical manifestation of the kingdom is like putting a, 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 a square peg into a circle. That's like trying to put Jesus physically on this earth. It mm. doesn't work. And so if these hermeneutical principles can be understood, we would have less confusion. Oh, yeah, because, well, I mean, you, you've kind of touched on this. Um, I was going to bring up uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. I know you, you touched on it briefly, but, but yep. this is kind of where a lot of eschatology hangs, is saying, doesn't this clearly say? 
Emilio that things are going to progress until he returns and puts all enemies under his feet. And you're saying there, there's a whole worldview attached to that, right? Yeah. It's a whole worldview. There's a whole hermeneutic. There's an entire eschatological tension and dynamic. And it's, it amazes me that people don't see that when we understand from the teaching of Jesus himself the tension of the kingdom, the already not yet. There is sort of the inaugural stage of that verse that has nothing in a sense that has that it that cannot be confused with the consummate stage mm. of that verse and so uh these issues brother are involved and that's why i try to put people within the framework of what i call the reformed encyclopedia because connected to all of this is also biblical theology your understanding of protology, meaning uh, the study of first things. You know what the word protology is, right? Mm -hmm. So the study of first things, not eschatology, but protology. And we know uh, nobody's done more work on this than G.K. Beale, but mm -hmm. that eschatology and protology go together. And so if you misunderstand the nature of protology, if you go on thinking things like the creational commission given to Adam has transferred over to the church, and now it's the church's job to finish what Adam did not do in taking dominion of the earth. Um, if you've adopted that, right, all of these points we're making, uh, they're not going to affect you because until you see the, the proper typological connection, not the dominion of Adam connecting to the church, but the dominion of Adam connecting to Christ and his cross work, you're never going to make the right conclusion exegetically. You're always going to keep coming to the false understanding so long as you don't understand protology. So there's a lot of factors involved in getting your, your eschatology uh, right as far as I'm concerned. So where are some good, <clears throat> as we're beginning to wind down, so what yeah. are some good passages of Scripture that kind of help put us on this right track of mm. eschatology? Now remind me of the name that you said uh, for kind of a, a relabeling of all millennialism. Ano millennialism. Ano millennialism. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I know we're talking about whole counsel of God, worldviews, uh, hermeneutics, but what are a few good passages, if you can maybe think of, of some to say, hey, this kind of encaptures what we're talking about here. I think one of the things that we need to do for people is to immediately define what the nature of the present age is. Mm. Is the present evil age talking about the old covenant? I think that's completely unfounded. And um, you and I were talking a little bit, I think, about, about what I did with the John Owen uh, episode we did on YouTube. Uh, but I tried to cover... Uh, some of his understanding, right, that the present evil age was referring basically to the Judaical church, the old covenant expiring 70 AD would essentially usher in the age to come, right, and that kind of phenomenon. Um, I think, man, I think Owen makes some, some, you know, some very, very uh, self-contradictory points in his writings on this. But at any stage, when you get a right definition of the two ages. And I think that that book by Bill Dennison mm. is a penetrating study, penetrating at the PhD level, uh, where he shows like, for example, in Ephesians chapter two, right? That this is not, this is not sensitive to Israel. This mm. has nothing to do with Israel and the old covenant. When it talks about that people follow what, he uses the Greek construction to speak both of, uh, of aeonos and cosmos, age and world. And when he says that they follow the course, or that Greek word there is age, they follow the age of this cosmos, what Paul has done is he's introduced two dynamics to understand this entire dimension in which we live. One is age, which is introducing us to a historical, time-sensitive issue, uh, speaking of the inner advental period. And then cosmos is going to speak of an ethical dimension, an ethical and spiritual dimension 
that is tethered to the present historical mm. age and that that is what the sons of disobedience belong to wow and so yeah go ahead i'm sorry no, I was just, well, I appreciate that plug. I'm definitely going to list that book in yeah. the, the show notes. Uh, if you can get it, if you can find it, who knows? I'll try. I'm gonna. Might be out of print. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Emilio, thank you so much for showing your heart and passion for eschatology because uh, essentially the name of this episode is going to be The Future of Apologetics is Eschatology. So these, <laughs> okay. hey, when you said that, I was like, yes, that's so good yeah. because this is this is practical. And I think it's challenging for those within the orthodox of eschatology to say, hey, there's still things that we need to iron out and talk about. And I just want to encourage uh, the audience, uh, go check out Emilio's interview with Lane Tipton, uh, because oh, y'all yeah. talked about his his paper that he wrote in his mid-20s, um, challenging the, the, the yeah, theonomy, the yeah, yeah, the theonomy, the, the theonomic principles of how Greg Bonson, you know, I thought this was an untouchable uh, topic, Emilio, but no, uh, Mike Tipton shows, you know what? Um, Greg Bonson actually put out there a standard, by what standard, uh, to critique his view of theonomy by, and Lane did it, right? Or at least he contended for it in his, um, in his paper. Yeah. So I really appreciated that interview that you did with Lane Tipton. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Lane is uniquely qualified to talk on those issues, and that, that, brother, that, that paper... <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's one that people need to contend with. And as of right now, there is no known rebuttal to, to Lane's argument. I, I think it's irrefutable. And uh, it shows uh, kind of like what you said, uh, eschatology matters, you know, and it showed in Bonson's works that Bonson actually, because of his misunderstanding of the eschatological framework of the Bible, mm. ended up actually articulating a, I want to use the word, but a false doctrine of a proper uh a proper uh a christian theory of knowledge and reality uh and ended up articulating something closer to kantian philosophy which was totally shocking uh to me but it's accurate and lane documented it so it's actually accurate so there's a lot at stake there brother this is a deep conversation and i hope yeah i hope at least maybe i i i perked people's interests in in some of the points that we that we covered so hey you you piqued my interest you even got me in the hot seat on some of those questions so i appreciate <laughs> that um, i'm a learner at heart emilio and so these are these are deep important issues that i want to encourage brothers that maybe disagree with you right now to just understand that this is a brotherly reminder and encouragement to sharpen one another and sometimes there's going to be sparks flying within that and so emilio before you leave uh is there any last words any any last thoughts um once again where people can find you and some of the upcoming work that you're doing yeah absolutely you know they can just go to the red uh red grace uh red grace media youtube uh, channel to to watch the episodes red grace live and also christ and kingdom we cover a lot of these topics through podcast uh and if they're in frisco looking for a church uh city view church frisco uh, they can just go right onto the website there and listen to sermons and whatnot. But I appreciate you doing that, and uh, look forward to look forward to seeing you at G three. And and uh, I'm sure we'll run into a lot of friends that we both know. So it should be a great time. Appreciate the time, brother. Absolutely, Emilio. Um, we're gonna have to do this again. I I'm gonna come back with questions, and I can't wait to pick your brain about those things. And once again, just thank you so much for your ministry. And contending for the faith and pointing people back to King Jesus. So take care, brother. You got it. You got it. Well, I just want to thank everybody um, for listening into that. Man, um, I learned a lot, and I'm definitely going to read a lot of those books that Emilio recommended. And so eschatology is important. And if you've been following my ministry, you know, I've been focusing a lot on those essentials of eschatology, about the future bodily coming of Jesus, who's going to restore all things and judge the living and the dead, and to show how full preterism is heresy. And so with um, talking to Emilio, he, he is putting forth a reformed eschatology saying, look, this is, a, an all, th this is an altogether system of thought, how you look at the triune God, um, not only with protology, like he's saying with um, the beginning, but God has sovereign, extensive purpose in all things, even leading up to the end. 
And so if you haven't already, please uh, subscribe and like um, The Apologetic Dog just to, to, to help the ministry circulate more content. And I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. God bless.